Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Miller. I'm the Director of Health Policy for the Council of State Governments. Welcome to today's CSG Policy Webinar, Health Reform Bracketology, What the Future May Hold. We're privileged to have on the line today three members of Levitt Partners, a nationally renowned healthcare intelligence business that provides its corporate clients a window to the future of healthcare. And we all know how iffy that future is right now. I have to tell you that when I first learned of their bracketology format, I was impressed. After all, I live in Kentucky, where college basketball is almost a religion. Um, let's go over a few housekeeping details. Everyone on the webinar will be in a listen-only mode, but you should see up in the right top corner of your screen a box where you can type in questions. Please feel free to submit those questions as the presentation is going on, and we'll ask as many of those question as questions at the end of the webinar as we have time to cover. We will post the audio and slides from the webinar on our Knowledge Center. We usually get those up about 24 hours after the webinar. Those of you who are on the call today or are participating in the webinar will get an email link to those audio, the audio and the slides. And of course, you should feel free to share that link with your colleagues. From Levitt's partners today, we have with us Brett Graham, Graham David Smith, and Laura Summers. Brett Graham is a partner at Levitt Partners and directs the health insurance exchange practice where he provides strategic advice and resources to a variety of clients. Prior to joining Levitt Partners, Mr. Graham led the operations and sale of a regional administrator of self-funded benefit plans to Maritain Health and stayed there at, uh, for some post-merger integration and strategy work. Prior to that time, he worked as the Vice President at United Healthcare with the Gen X Business Unit and has also spent some time with the Boston Consulting Group. He holds a master's degree in business administration from Harvard Business School, and also a master's in public administration and a bachelor from the University of Utah. And this will mean something to a number of our elected um, officials on the call. While at the University of Utah, he was elected student body president and had an opportunity to serve on the University Board of Trustees. So he knows about elections. David Smith is an analyst at Levitt Partners, where he performs extensive research analysis of the payer practice with a focus on following insurance market trends, the regulatory environment, and public programs. Mr. Smith also assists the firm in tracking economic and government budget indicators. As such, he's pursuing a master's degree in econometrics at the University of Law, to, Law School, University of Utah, I'm sorry. And prior to that, he also has been a student body vice president at Utah Valley University. Must be a prerequisite to work at Levitt Partners. Laura Summers is an analysis analyst at Levitt Partners with expertise in economics, healthcare, and public policy. Her professional experience includes public policy research for the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Prior to joining the partners, Ms. Summers worked for the Utah Foundation, a well-respected research firm that publishes reports on issues affecting state and local practices. She has a master's degree in public policy from Brigham Young and graduated from Westminster College with degrees in economics and international business. Now we'll turn over our webinar to our speakers from the Levitt Partners. Thank you. This is Brett Graham. You now know more about us than you probably care to, but let me take a second here and, and talk a little bit about the firm. And the reason of doing so is because I think it's important as you hear what we have to say and evaluate its relevance and also determine how you're going to use or not use what we talk about here. I think it's important to know a little bit about Levitt Partners and not necessarily us individually. Clearly, Levitt Partners was, was a firm that was created by former Secretary Mike Levitt. Uh, he had the experience of being a three-term governor as well as then a Secretary of Health and Human Services to look at the issue and the challenge that is facing the nation around health care 
came to the conclusion that probably many of us have, which is it's unsustainable and, and much change needs to occur. And well before President Obama had really gone down the track of proposing uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, Governor, Governor Levitt then decided to form a, a organization with many of the folks he had worked at, both at uh, HHS as well as as governor, to really start to help organizations make sense of this and really provide them intelligence recognizing that organizations typically often have great strategic planning processes, but they ultimately need to, to rely or depend on assumptions as they drive through those processes. So some of the things we focus on, on on a firm, as a firm, are on Medicaid. I've put up a slide here really quickly that we, we term Medicaid intelligence. We here, we uh, focus on some of the things that are going on in states to be able to determine and help organizations understand really how they might uh, be able to help states, what states are doing, what they're doing with respect to delivery system, pharmacy, budget, and others, and also how the waiver processes are going. We, we do this by um, providing intel and gathering information and tracking that in the, in, in, in the Medicaid space. Laura will talk a little bit about that later as we go through our presentation. We also do something similar on insurance exchanges. Insurance exchanges obviously have gone from being a, a fairly unknown um, piece of the law to being one of the central points because of the role that they will play in both uh, determining eligibility as well as, as, as actually distributing subsidies to a large um, portion of the population. We track what's happening in states from a legislative perspective, from an establishment perspective, as well as um, from a model um, look at what they're doing. We, we track this and provide this to our clients and as they determine how to go forward. In some instances, we're also helping the states make sense of this and, and progress through their planning and development processes. David. Great. Thank you. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to the main event here. And it was, it's been firmed up and, and teed up as bracketology. And uh, let me just say a little bit about what this is and, and what we hope the purpose is. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market right now, and what we're hoping that we can do in the next 30 to 35 minutes, uh, and then with some Q&A after, is to try and compress that uncertainty and simplify it in a way that, that helps you have a, at least a little bit of a clearer sense of the future. Um, bracketology, of course, is a fun way to apply that, and it's, it's really it's, it's been the way that we've done this for a couple of years. The, the corollary that we have with this, and, and with uncertainty generally, is, is kind of found in some books that were really popular about 10 to 15 years ago. You may be familiar with these, but they were called Choose Your Own Adventure Books. And what the, the hallmark of these books is that it would set up a story at the beginning. And let's say, for example, that, that you're, you know, you're younger, you're hanging out with some friends on a Saturday, you're bored, and you decide to, to go pursue this rumor about buried treasure in an abandoned mine shaft. And so the first 20 pages are about you getting out there and setting up the characters and everything else of that nature. And, as you get to page 20, you have a decision to make. You can either turn to page 27, which is to go into this foreboding uh, mine shaft and, and, and pursue your interest, uh, or you go, would turn to page 77, uh, and you would turn around and, and, and kind of have a different day. And what you would find is you would, you would trigger a sequence of events that had some kind of an outcome or an eventuality. Uh, the problem with these books and making those decisions, of course, is that you always had very imperfect information from which to make that decision. And that's really the environment in which we find ourselves in, in today, uh, most notably with health care and health policy. So there's three things that really make up our bracketology thinking and three things that really are driving this uncertainty today. Uh, of course, the first is the Supreme Court, where, uh, as you probably are, uh, like us, are, are waiting with bated breath to uh, identify how the justices will rule. We'll give you a little bit of perspective there. Uh, the second, of course, is the election. And the third is this notion of a fiscal cliff, which uh, you've undoubtedly been hearing more and more about and will certainly continue to hear more and more about in the days and weeks ahead prior to uh, uh, the election. It's really the confluence of these three separate events uh, that cast this uncertainty and really the way in which we treat bracketology and try to simplify these scenarios. So we'll start with the Supreme Court uh, because, one, it's, it's certainly the most imminent, uh, but secondly, it probably has the widest implications and repercussions for health policy in the United States at this point. Uh, of course, this, this case was brought by 26 states and the National Federation of Independent Businesses, 
and uh, accelerated its way through the courts and the appellate courts and, and district courts to find itself sitting at, at the Supreme Court. And really, it's about four different things. The first is, is the Anti-Injunction Act, which is essentially a, a, an older uh, statute that dictates that uh, before the Supreme Court can actually rule on a statute that's a tax, the tax has to have gone into effect. So really this is a question, it's an interpretive question about whether or not the individual mandate is a penalty or a tax. Uh, so that's the first thing that they rule on. The second, of course, is the most popular, which is the, the question as to the constitutionality of the individual mandate itself. Uh, the third is akin to that. And, and that is the rest of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, is that severable from the mandate? In other words, will the justices overturn the totality of the law, or just one thing, or just a few things? Uh, and then the fourth is the Medicaid expansion, which, which again, the argument is that it represents an overreach of the federal government. I think prior to the oral arguments in April, the conventional thinking around all of this was that the law would largely be upheld. There was uh, there was reason to believe that at least one of the conservative justices who make up a, a majority on, on the bench of, of five versus the four that were appointed by, by Democrats uh, would switch ranks and, and would be the swing vote that would uphold this. Uh, clearly, through the commentary and the oral arguments, uh, both Justices Roberts and Kennedy uh, demonstrated, uh, demonstrated that they had some angst and some reservations about the individual mandate, and that really threw uh, the, the entire conventional thinking um, uh, up into turmoil. So as we look through these four different things, what we'd like to do is simplify this to just a couple of scenarios. First, going back to the Anti-Injunction Act, uh, our perspective is that nothing will probably happen here, that the court will not deem that this is a tax, they will decide not to defer it, and that this will, that the, the other provision or the other elements will be decided on in short order. So then, that, then it begs the question, what happens to the entire law? And does the severability clause become relevant here? Uh, or does the sever question of severability become relevant? Typically, in these types of cases, the Supreme Court has demonstra demonstrated a precedent uh, to look for an actual severability clause in the legislation, especially uh, in, in pieces of complex legislation. So we really have every reason to believe that, that in the absence of such a clause in, in PPACA, uh, that the court will, will probably not exceed that precedent or its mandate in overturning the entire law. We certainly concede that it's still possible. We just think it's, it's fairly unlikely. Uh, the third, then, is the Medicaid expansion and whether or not the court would overturn that. Uh, again, this is possible, but, but two things lead us to believe that it might be less possible. Uh, the first, again, is if you listen to the oral arguments, uh, even from the conservative justices, there's not quite as much pressure on the plaintiffs and, and not quite as much, uh, as much pressure uh, to, to overturn that, as, at least if you take that as an indicator. The second is what the Supreme Court would actually have to overturn to do this, and, and again, this goes back to precedent. Uh, in 1935, there was a case uh, that, that was brought to the Supreme Court. It was Stewart. Uh, Stewart Machine versus Davis. This was essentially a case that dealt with uh, unemployment compensation, and it really became about how much influence the federal government can exert over states in this program. Uh, the way that the Supreme Court ruled in that uh, leads us to believe, and many other legal scholars to believe, that you would actually have to overturn that law, which is a fairly uh, significant precedent to overturn what the Congress has done here. So again, possible that the Medicaid expansion gets struck down, but a little bit less likely than some of the other scenarios. This then really takes us to, it simplifies all of that into a couple of different potential outcomes. Uh, the first is that the mandate itself is overturned. Uh, it, it's possible that other provisions could be overturned with it uh, for the same reasons that, that we don't think the whole law would get turned over. We, we don't believe very much else will get turned over with this, particularly guaranteed issue and community rating if, uh, if you've been watching this. Uh, another element of that is that the court certainly has political sensitivities right now that it might not have had in other terms, uh, given the, the popularity of this case and, and how it's being watched. The court wants to make sure that um, it, it's distancing itself from the perception that it's being political in any way and really has no reason to not defer the question of guaranteed issue and community rating back to the Congress. Uh, the second, of course, is that the law is upheld in, in its totality. And the third is really everything else, uh, which, again, we think has a low probability, possible, but a low probability. 
Uh, there's every reason to believe that this is going to end up being a, a very split vote, uh, five to four in either direction. Uh, a further piece of evidence was given last Friday night when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was speaking to a, a bunch of attorneys in D.C. and said that the most divided cases would be deferred to the very end of the session, and as the session progressed, you would see more and more of these uh, kind of the stark uh, polarization within the court itself. So. Uh, a little, a little teaser there from uh, from Justice Ginsburg uh, again makes us think that the court will be fairly split. From a date perspective, uh, if, if you're like us, you were watching your BlackBerry or your your iPhone all morning, waiting to see if uh, if you got that that email that told you that the that it would be overruled again. It did not happen today. Uh, the last two dates really that that are most probable to take place are on Monday and on Thursday. Uh, we, we anticipate it will probably be next Thursday uh, that the decision is made, which is uh, the last day of the term. Um, the, the Beltway, is, the, the rumor mill within the Beltway is, is churning. In fact, uh, we, uh, we spent the last couple of days out there and uh, continue to hear rumors about July and, and the like. And uh, again, we, we think June 28th will be the date and that it will take place next week. Uh, of course, the implications of that decision are huge, irrespective of the election, irrespective of the fiscal cliff. Uh, it has huge implications for, for health policy, and uh, we're, we're happy to walk through some of those implications uh, if there's any questions in, in the Q&A portion. As we move to the second element that can really have a destabilizing effect on key packets, it's really the, the 2012 election. Uh, of course, the two gentlemen that you see on your screen right now really represent uh, the, the essence of, of, of the ideological divide within the country right now between uh, Republicans and Democrats. Um, President Obama and uh, the, uh, you know, his constituents and, and those that support him politically have uh, made, made commitments to a type of potential doubling down. That it, in other words, if the Supreme Court gives the green light by upholding and they're reelected, uh, they essentially will take that as an endorsement in policy and will continue to, to make further reforms to health care. Uh, in the in the event that they in the in the event that the Supreme Court does do something that's destabilizing, uh, they've given every indication that they will work to implement this to the fullest extent if given the opportunity. Uh, in fact, just last week, Secretary Sebelius and Acting CMS uh, Administrator Marilyn Tavner uh, both made comments to that effect, saying that they were ready for any contingency plan. Uh, of course, on the other side of the Republicans. Uh, who are, are beginning to put a little bit more of a framework around their intentions, but continue to beat the repeal and replace drum, saying that on day one they'll issue waivers to all 50 states, and on day two uh, it's their intention to repeal the law. Uh, really, this election is, is not uh, obviously about these two men. It's about a myriad of different things. Uh, if you look at the word cloud that we have up here, there's, there's a, a variety of different su subjects and topics going from organized labor, uh, Greece and the Euro crisis, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, really, uh, the election will become about three central things, one of which we're talking about today. Uh, but of course, uh, the economy will, will be one of the central drivers, uh, national security with respect to, to Iran, Syria, and some of the like there, and then uh, again, health care. Uh, health care is an important issue. It will probably not end up being the driving issue of the election. Uh, the Supreme Court decision will certainly play a role in this and in the healthcare debate and dialogue. And again, we, we're happy to comment on uh, the direction we see that influencing uh, the election uh, to the extent that Supreme Court rules. So from here, there's really eight unique scenarios in which the Congress can be composed and the White House can be composed, uh, ranging between Democrats and Republicans. And what we've done is we've selected three scenarios that, again, we think are the most likely. Uh, just as a disclaimer, these are not scenarios that, that we ideologically are pulling for. These are not disclaimers we necessarily want. These are really scenarios in which looking at polling data and the political trends at the moment are the more likely trends. The first is what we term to be a Democrat gridlock. Uh, this is where things exist as they are today. Uh, President Obama retains the White House. Republicans retain the, the House of Representatives, probably led by Speaker Boehner. And uh, Harry Reid continues to lead Democrats in the Senate, albeit without a filibuster-proof majority. We, we certainly don't anticipate that as a possibility. The second scenario is a gridlock of a different sort, where, again, that Congress stays split, but you have a President Romney is now in a position um, 
of executive authority. And uh, again, we call these both of these scenarios gridlock because we just don't anticipate uh, that a lot gets done from a legislative perspective, whether it's PPACA or, or other in that environment. Uh, the third is a little bit less likely, but still a scenario nevertheless that we do treat in our analysis because, again, we believe it's more likely than others, and that's this notion of a Republican sweep. If in the event that, president, that we have a President Romney, uh, Republicans between the House of Representatives and Republicans are able to eke out a, a majority in the Senate, um, the, the, there's a little bit more leverage and, and influence there. Uh, of course, we again do not believe there's any chance Republicans get a filibuster-proof Senate in this scenario at this point, uh, which does bring some limitations in their ability to enact policy, uh, particularly with respect to uh, PPACA. So these are the election outcomes that we treat. Finally, we, we want to just talk briefly about this notion of a fiscal cliff. Um, this is important from a health policy perspective because heretofore, uh, most policy watchers have anticipated that Healthcare would really be the first thing that would be dealt with in the next session. The PPACA, uh, the, you know, if, if the Supreme Court ruled in, in any event, uh, PPACA would be one of those elements that would be discussed or further health reform would be discussed. What the, what the fiscal cliff is essentially saying is at the end of the year, several tax policies expire, uh, notably the Bush tax cuts and, and other cuts of that nature. Um, the sequestration goes into effect, which of course is part of the debt ceiling uh, deal reached last summer. Uh, you have cuts to Medicare through uh, the sustainable growth rate formula, 27%. That has to be dealt with at the end of the year. And to top all of that off, uh, you uh, the, the Congress will have to grapple with the debt ceiling, uh, which incidentally might even come before uh, that, and, and very uh, there's a very remote possibility it could come before the election. So there's a lot of things that the next Congress will immediately have to deal with. Uh, the implications for these really fall into a couple of different ways. On, on the one end, if the Congress decides to do nothing and they, they let these, these cuts and the, and the cuts and the tax uh, increases or the tax sunsettings go into effect, the Congressional Budget Office has projected that we'll go into a recession in the first half of 2013. We'll have very moderate growth after that. Uh, on the other end of that, uh, the CBO has also projected that if you roll back all of the policies and, and you pump these out into the future, that um, you might have better economic growth, but you're going to continue ticking up that debt. A 90% debt to GDP or 125% debt to GDP if you consider the intergovernmental lending that takes place on the debt. Uh, the other element here is, of course, the potential for credit agency downgrades, uh, which becomes very acute in the, in the uh, a scenario where the Congress does nothing. What we think is most likely is this outcome at the bottom, where uh, the Congress will, uh, despite the political composition, uh, have the ability to cut four and a half to five and a half trillion uh, over the next 10 years. And, and we think, again, this is especially important because health policy, particularly PPACA, uh, will be a source of those savings. And health policy uh, changes or enactments will certainly be a part of this fiscal cliff discussion. So this really brings us into bracketology itself, and, and what you've seen here is we've set up 16 different combinations of Supreme Court scenarios, um, eight different combinations of election scenarios. If you take just a few of the provisions within the law, you have 64 different provision scenarios. So this leads up to a little over 8,000 different ways in which the world could look uh, this time next year. And so what this bracketology discussion is intended to do is, is, again, as we've done so far, is to simplify some of the assumptions uh, in a way that make it a, a little bit more digestible and, and puts you in a position to make decisions uh, that, that are relevant in your organization. And uh, if you go to this website, I'll show it to you really quickly, and then we'll get into the um, some quick discussion here. But healthreformbracketology.com uh, provides the tool that you see on your screen right here. And we'll update this periodically, and we'll continue to refine our assumptions as they become relevant. Uh, but this tool, it's an interactive PDF. And essentially, you, you click to begin, as it says there. Uh, that will give you a hyperlink to this, which uh, is, is kind of the main menu. You have the option here on the left side to choose a potential Supreme Court decision. Uh, this decision, of course, becomes a little less relevant, possibly, in the next week. Uh, but once you choose that, let's say if we were to select that the law is upheld, uh, then you can choose a 2012 election outcome. Uh, we've put the three outcomes that we indicated to you earlier that we think are the more likely outcomes. So 
let's again, for example, say that we select Republican gridlock. Uh, we have this option now in the middle that says the future of health reform. And from here, uh, we can select that and we get an output page that really just gives you some of the thinking of, uh, of the folks that we employ, folks that have been uh, uh, executives within CMS and in the private industry, uh, our analyst team here, uh, other experts just throughout the healthcare spectrum. So we would certainly invite you to, to go to healthreformbracketology.com and go into a little bit of the deeper information. Uh, what we'll do with our remaining uh, 12 or 13 minutes before the Q&A is walk through some of the provisions we think are, are probably of most interest to you as uh, as state stakeholders, particularly Medicaid exchanges and the like, and tell you where we think those fall under these different scenarios. And what we'll do is we'll start with the scenario that the mandate's overturned, and, and we'll turn it over to Laura Summers for uh, a moment to walk us through this. So I'm just going to briefly walk through some of the Medicaid provisions, and I'll turn it over to Brett, who's going to be discussing kind of more of the state insurance-related provisions. Now, as David just showed in the, uh, the Bracketology website, if you go online, you'll see that we just kind of cover Medicaid in one kind of topic. We just we generally cover just Medicaid as one big topic. However, for the purposes of this presentation, we actually wanted to break it down into several different provisions because, I'm, as I'm sure all of you are aware, the Medicaid provisions in the PPHCA are, are many, and they can be broken up in many ways. There's payment reform, there's benefit reform, um, nursing home accountability, program integrity reform. But the ones that we wanted to focus mostly on today was the three big ones. Um, the first one's the Medicaid expansion, obviously. The Medicaid will be expanded to all people, well, all adults ages 19 to 64, up to 133% of the federal poverty level, as well as kind of the funding that's related to that as well. The second is the maintenance of effort, uh, where states are required to keep their benefits um, at a certain level, eligibility and benefits at a certain level, at least until 2014 and some into 2019. And then the last one, this is kind of a unique one, but we put it on here because we thought it might have a bit of a different outcome, but there are a lot of Medicaid demonstrations, pilot programs, and grants um, related to states developing innovative ideas in their Medicaid programs. The DUALS initiative is a great example of one of these. We included it here because we thought that this one may have you know, some slightly different outcomes than the other two, depending on the scenario. So just in terms of the Republican suite, um, we saw all three of those would be in this upper quadrant, which has the highest likelihood of disruption and the highest degree of change. So as far as the Medicaid expansion, if there is a Republican president and the Republicans sweep the Congress, then we think that that's either going to be repealed, and if it's not able to be repealed, then it will most likely be reduced. Um, another kind of implication with this is the budget issues. If a Republican does take the office, we do think the economy will be either stagnant, kind of in the place where it is now, or worsening. And so that kind of has an effect on a lot of the Medicaid provisions. So if we do have a Republican president, they'll either try to repeal that or reduce the amount of the expansion or the amount of funding that is given. Um, as far as the MOE, again, we think that that's going to be repealed. If it's not repealed, then we believe that the administration will provide flexibility through waivers to states. Um, and then the last one is the Medicaid demonstration. Uh, we believe that those will either be repealed, although we think it's more likely the amount of funding made available to those will be reduced. And the ones that have already been implemented, such as the dual initiatives, will most likely remain. Um, and kind of the other thinking behind this is that anything that hasn't already been approved, the administration will just try to slow down. But we think that there is kind of bipartisan support for these, so we don't, we don't see it being as pushed as hard to repeal those, unless there's a major budget issue there. Great, thank you. Well, like Laura has suggested with respect to the Medicaid provisions being in the upper right, you'll note that also premium subsidies and exchanges are also in that upper right quadrant, which suggests a high degree of change, a high likelihood of change, as well as a high degree of change. And so this is where an area um, that the Republicans, now with newfound power, would focus on. This is an interesting, uh, interesting position if this were to occur, because exchanges, although they have a, a history that, that, that far outdates the, the actual Affordable Care Act, um, they have become a lightning rod for criticism and really uh, pointed attacks 
um, to, to stop the Affordable Care Act. Exchanges would, in this instance, likely be a target such that the administration and the Congress would seek to, to repeal them, uh, like uh, Mike Laura had, had talked about as well. Whether or not they'd be successful in doing that without a filibuster um, Senate would be questionable, but that's, that would be the, the intent there. And the intent would be to, to focus on them in such a way that really they focus to instead distribute some type of subsidy. In this case, it might would be something that would be more of a means-tested subsidy, which, which would be the goal of the Republicans through something which would be a more of a private exchange model. And so you'd see more focus on private, and you see focus on means subsidies, means test subsidies for the premium subsidies. Great. Um, so kind of moving now, just thinking in terms of moving from a Republican suite to a Republican gridlock, what this scenario might, how it might look different under this next scenario. Um, if we first look at the Medicaid expansion, um, you can kind of see how the bullet, how we think it'll change there. Again, as far as the expansion goes, we think under a gridlock scenario, even if we have a Republican president, it's probably largely going to remain as is. They're not going to be able to um, overturn the law per se, but we do think that there could possibly be some reductions if there are major budget pressures, and the administration could provide some flexibility through waivers on this to states who are really suffering in terms of their budget. Um, in terms of the maintenance of effort, again, we think that flexibility most likely will be provided through waivers under this scenario. So they won't be able to repeal the law, but they'll be able to provide that state flexibility through waivers or through additional options. And then as far as the demonstration program, um, again, most likely will remain as is, but the administration will change the focus of the initiative so they support more state flexibility. And it would really be likely for the administration and kind of the politicos to relook at the agenda and use either existing waivers or design new waivers kind of around these initiatives so that they are more supportive of state flexibility and state innovation rather than kind of federal mandated innovation. So with respect to premium subsidies, this goes also from a high degree of change down to a lesser degree of change, but, but very likelihood that disruption would occur. In this instance, with the premium subsidies, where before the Republicans had, um, had control of both houses of Congress and the presidency, in this Republican gridlock scenario, they would have less of an opportunity to, to make the change. As a result, what would occur is they would probably look to have just a reduction in the size of, of the actual premium subsidies, going from 400% probably down to something less than that in the 250 to 300% range. With respect to exchanges, exchanges follow suit in the sense that they would be a lesser degree of change, but still high likelihood. In this instance, what would occur most likely would be that the, the administration would seek to give states much more authority through waivers to be able to have control over this. You'd see more public-private exchanges or partnerships start to be able to be established to facilitate that role. Um, all right, so moving from the Republican gridlock to the Democrat gridlock, just to kind of go over the Medicaid provisions again, in terms of the Medicaid expansion, um, we believe that it will probably remain as is under the current law, under the current CPACA. So there wouldn't be a lot of change to that. You would still see the expansion going up to 133% of the FCL. The only caveat we put on this is, again, that budget pressure. Um, obviously, if, we are, if we're still suffering from deficits and state budgets are still under tremendous pressure, there could be some slight reduction, but we don't think it's likely. Um, the maintenance of effort, again, is probably going to remain as is under the current law, perhaps scaled back if state budgets continue to skyrocket. And there also has been shown for, to be some Democratic support for this. So we could see some Democratic governors pushing for some relief from this as well, which could result in some changes there. Um, and then as far as the demonstrations, pilots, and grants, again, because this isn't as big of an issue, it will probably remain as is currently under the PPACA. So with re respect to premium subsidies, if you you'll see that premium subsidies we actually leave still in that, that right lower quadrant, which means that they would still be a focus and still have some change. Where they might not drop in terms of the FPL all the way down to 250 to 300%, we think that, that because of the budget process, 
uh, budget pressures, they'll likely still be reduced somewhat from their 400% of FPL today. The exchanges moved over from the lower right quadrant to the lower left, which means that this is less likely for disruption and less degree of change. In this scenario, um, this would be a, a democratic gridlock, which is similar to what we have today. We believe that exchanges would be implemented uh, very much as, as, uh, as the law calls for um, today. Um, so I think we're going to just quickly go over the law being upheld, and I'm going to move through mine um, actually really fast because we actually don't see any differences in Medicaid under the mandate being overturned and the law being over the law being upheld. So I'll go ahead and move um, the different Medicaid. If, if you want to talk briefly about premium subsidies and exchanges in this scenario, sure, you bet. So in this in the law upheld, you'll note that premium subsidies are still. Um, in the upper right, this is because we have a Republican sweep up there and uh, still a focus like the conversation we had um, prior. With respect to exchanges, in this instance, um, we, we see with, our, with the law being upheld in Republican sweep, we see um, really more exchanges, changes really being uh, focused on that because the law is upheld really more legislatively and attacking some of the provisions there and really working for more market, market um, solutions there. Great. So moving from the Republican sweep to the Republican gridlock, um, again, we um, the, the Medicaid provisions we see all under the same scenarios that I just briefly discussed before. So there could be some reduction in the SPL. There could be, there most likely will be some reduction in the maintenance of effort, and again, possibly some reduction in the, the, the demonstrations making them more state focused. So with respect to exchanges and premium subsidies, um, if we go to a Republican gridlock, in this instance, if you want to hit the button for those, okay, go. Premium subsidies falls down. Um, similar to the, the scenario we talked about before where there's Republican gridlock, Republicans would be in a position to change it as much, but still they would focus on it. And again, we think that they would be reduced probably to the range of the 250 to 300% of FPL uh, range. With respect to exchanges, here again, less change, but still uh, focused by the, um, the Republican administration to provide more flexibility to states. Um, and also in this instance, we would see the law, you know, we have a law upheld in this instance, but we see less of a role for the federal fallback exchange. Um, so moving to a Democratic, Democrat gridlock, um, with the Medicaid provisions, again, all of these we really just uh, C remaining as is. So all of those move over into the lower left quadrant. And then Brett, if you want to discuss sure. the you? movement of the other two. So premium subsidies, similar to the last Democrat gridlock uh, scenario that we talked about, Democrats uh, are, are in power as they are today with a split Congress, likely to have some reduction in the size of the subsidies, just primarily driven by a need to compromise as well as the budget pressures, but it likely be um, less than the the, 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 um, the 250 to 300 percent of FPL, which the Republicans would push for, and more in the 300 to 350 percent of FPL. In with respect to the exchanges, here again, laws upheld, Democrats in control. Uh, we expect the exchanges to move forward uh, very similar to how they're prescribed today. And uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll we'll close and, and and we'll wind this down. Just the last thing that we have up here is a, is a quote we included um, from Lee Iacocca, and this is really, you know, the main, one of the main messages that the Love of Partners has kind of promulgated is that despite the extraordinary uh, degree of uncertainty right now, all stakeholders, whether on the private side or the public side, are also in in, in a position to uh, be able to at least start distilling some of this uncertainty in a way that leads to action. And um, of course, that, that's happening throughout the country right now. Uh, we continue to encourage folks that, um, that are faced with this uncertainty to really break it down to kind of its core elements and, and continue to move in ways that, that align with, with your processes and, um, and the things that, that really drive the mechanics of your state. Uh, grateful to, to Deb and her staff and the, and the Council of State Governments for the invitation. And uh, we'll go ahead and pause here for any questions or commentary. Okay, we've had a couple of questions come in. I'm going to uh, shorten this one a little, but uh, first off, the representative asking the question certainly agrees that the future is uncertain. He says, without going into political winners and losers, 
how do we in the state keep our head in the game and prepare for the future? I think he's looking for something a little different. A little different set of advice than just the scenarios. Our citizens will continue to get sick. Our hospitals and doctors want to get paid. The push will be to have less federal money. Robust economy uh, doesn't seem likely. Meanwhile, technology continues to develop. What's the state to do? So, you know, not not <laughs> knowing um, what what state we're talking about or kind of the the. the kind of position the representatives in, but knowing where states are today. I'll go back to a kind of a several conversations I, I've uh, been a part of with Governor Levitt and also governors that are, are asking that same question, which is what do we do, recognizing there's so much uncertainty, but yet the problem isn't getting any better on its own, what do we do? You know, the Lee Iacocca statement is, 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 is well-intentioned in that action is the best course uh, for this, this time period recognizing that, uh, that we have to move forward with the uncertainty. Um, one of the things that has be become clearer through this process is that there is flexibility for states that act. The flexibility that uh, will not be provided to states, regardless of whether they're blue or red or purple, is for the states that don't act. And so, you know, the, the suggestion or recommendation, though it's not specific, that I would give is find out what's, determine what's best for your state and then pursue that path, recognizing that the path will be modified, but pursue it even if it's not 100% of what the, the law currently requires, um, but it, or, or, or it's not 100% of, of what is exactly, you know, of, of what you would do in a perfect world. Pursue the path that makes sense for the state, and then negotiate with the federal government as you go along. And the fact is that the, the federal government is looking for states to do much of the work, and so a state that takes action will be given more latitude than a state that doesn't. For the state that calls the question and plays chicken, what will happen is in those states, the federal government will be required um, to, to step in, and when they step in, they won't provide much latitude. So I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think action and, 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 and action specific for your state is, is what I would recommend. Okay, we have a, a sort of a legalistic uh, question for you. In your opinion, if the Supreme Court severed TPACA, where would they sever it? I guess, in other words, what's most likely to stand and what's most likely to go? So our, our belief, and I'll invite my colleagues to jump in here afterwards as well, we, we believe that really the most likely outcome today um, is probably that, in fact, the mandate is overturned and only the mandate, nothing else. That said, we don't think that probability is 80% to 20% something else. We think that it's actually much less than 50. So we think there are several likely outcomes, but this one simply, in our estimation, is the most likely. So if, if, if the question is what's likely to go, we think it's the mandate and the mandate only because we don't think the court will reach into the law and start to strike down the provisions. We think the court will, will opine on those insurance provisions, but we don't think that uh, it'll go beyond that. I invite Laura or David to, to add to that or, or disagree with me on that. Well, I, so the, the only other wrinkle I'd add to that is we'll certainly concede the point that it's kind of a rarity right now when you see the plaintiffs and, 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 the, and well, both sides of this come to agreement on something, but that they did prior to the Supreme Court ruling, which is where the which is when the Department of Justice uh, filed a brief with the court requesting that if the mandate was overturned, that both a guaranteed issue and community rating would be overturned. Uh, of course, the states had no objection to that. Uh, so I, I think if anything gets overturned in this scenario with the mandate, it's probably those two elements. But I would certainly agree with, with Brett's notion. Uh, and again, just raise the, 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 uh, the idea here that uh, the Supreme Court finds itself in a little bit of an uncomfortable position, and uh, you know one of the one of the hallmarks of being a Supreme Court justice is making sure that you're defending um, the mantra and the uh, um, uh, the, the, the overall um, uh, nonpartisan uh, nature of the Supreme Court, and they will certainly be sensitive. Uh, and there's no there's really no way for the Supreme Court here to win, of course, but uh, they'll be sensitive to mitigate that in a way to not be uh, perceived as making uh, policy decisions, and again, we'll probably just defer other elements of that to the Congress. 
Yeah, and this is Laura. The only thing I would add is the kind of the Medicaid perspective, and it's exactly in line with what Brett and David just spoke about. We don't really see that being severable, so the only way we see that being overturned is if the law in its entirety is overturned. You know, of course, there's, there's always room that it could go anyway, and that, that piece itself was kind of a speculation as to whether that the Medicaid expansion itself was constitutional. So the thinking of our firm at this point is that, that the only way the Medicaid piece would be overturned is if the entire law is overturned. Okay. Um, sort of falls right into another question that was asked. If the individual mandate is struck, but the remainder of the law is upheld, as you all have just sort of predicted as a more likely um, outcome, how will these policies survive without significant increase in premium? So to, to that point, you know, how will these policies survive with, without significant increases in premiums? We believe that there will be significant increases in premiums. <laughs> the Congress will then, and then, yeah, and then some of the, the, this will you know certainly if, 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 if the outcome that we predict not necessarily per, I will say I will say we not prefer but predict if that in fact occurs which is the striking of the mandate and nothing else we believe that then there will be a significant call to action to the Congress to deal with this because you're you know the point you make which is insurance provisions are such and insurance principles are such that it really requires actuarially for rates to increase dramatically in certain circumstances and that will have an impact on the, the population that insured and all of the provisions we're talking about we believe that Congress will be forced to deal with that uh, the challenge will be how do they deal with it in a in a split or a gridlock scenario uh, so to that end uh, it, it's clear that the breadth point for this, particularly if guaranteed issue state as a factor, uh, it just has destabilizing effects and really creates a considerable uncertainty in, in, in the face of congressional gridlock. Uh, both sides have, have kind of looked at you know, what's problematic about this is that guaranteed issue is also popular and this notion of uh, not excluding coverage for folks with pre-existing conditions. So a Republicans go to response to this as less strength and risk pools. And, and that's kind of how they would replace guaranteed issue, um, either from an administrative perspective or a congressional perspective. Uh, Democrats continue to talk about, uh, you know, very, very ambiguously about replacements that, that they think they could pursue for guaranteed issue. But um, again, it, it's clear that um, without either skyrocketing uh, premiums or trying to force the system into a single pay, single payer scheme, a uh, current guaranteed issue would have to go um, by the wayside and have to happen through the Congress. Okay, sort of a, another question along the, the predictions lines. Um, noticing that in several of the scenarios, you, um, you looked at the subsidies, the premium subsidies being reduced. The question is, politically, who would get the pressure to provide care to the uninsured, states or feds? Well, I think it depends on the, on the scenario we're looking at. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head, so I would invite Brett or David to jump in here as needed. But I would think, you know, under the, the law being upheld, that would kind of, you know, obviously just turn back to the federal government because the Medicaid expansion probably would remain likely as high as it is under the PPACA. So a lot of those uninsured, at least those up to 133%, would fall into the Medicaid expansion. If the law is overturned or if there's a Republican, um, gridlock or Republican sweep, I think you would probably see some of that actually turning more back towards the state with the federal government providing either the administration or the federal government trying to provide more flexibility to states. But with in turn with that flexibility, you would they would get be more responsible for some of those uninsured as well. The, the question is an interesting one. Who has the responsibility today for for taking care of the uninsured? Does, does the state or does the federal government? Well, the reason why it's a complex question is because it's the state, but they have so much of the funding for Medicaid comes through the federal government. Uh, as Lars noted, this, this expansion of Medicaid is not insignificant, and in fact, in many states, it's very, very significant. And so, uh, depending on how you look at that, on, on who owns Medicaid, do states own it or does the federal government? I think your perspective on that um, drives largely the answer to that question with respect to who would have the ownership or where would the pressure lie. I think that uh, 
you know, we have, in, in this scenario, have not suggested in any way that we think Medicaid, unless the entire law is overturned, which we think is one of the least likely scenarios, um, would, would in fact that piece go away. So I think the pressure still remains. If the subsidies are reduced, right, that just reduces the, the amount for those that are not eligible for Medicaid today. And I think um, we would still have a problem. The uninsured will not go away entirely in any scenario. One, one other bellwether I think that, that, that anybody could really look to is what are the Republicans saying they would do? I admit Romney about a week and a half ago, I think it was two Sundays ago on Face the Nation, made the, the comment of the defense of, of course, Massachusetts health reform and really said that if, given the, if, if he was in a position to do this, he would try and defer as much health reform to states as possible. Uh, that, of course, is politically driven at this point in time that um, Republicans, if Republicans find themselves in a position where they own health care on a federal level, uh, it, it will be very natural for them to try and defer as much of that to the states as they think is possible. Okay. A very practical question comes in. If the law is overturned, do you have any idea what will happen with funding that's already been provided to the states, i.e. for exchanges, home visitation programs, etc.? Would it have to be returned to the federal government, to HHS? <laughs> This is a question we've actually had conversations with uh, with folks within uh, HHS, and our understanding of this is that uh, funding that has been encumbered or has been contracted for. So, for let's take an example, an exchange. If 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 a state has received a grant of some sort and has allocated that and started to spend that money and committed it, then that funding would continue to flow. For uncommitted funds and it's very likely that they would come back to the federal government in some form or fashion. So uh, I guess what I'm suggesting here is that if the law is overturned, that the, the winding down of the activities would be orderly or as orderly as possible. They wouldn't come to a We do know that many states that are currently pursuing activities today, that they would put things immediately on hold while they figured them out. A, a state that was maybe bluer, if I can use that term, and was wanting to push forward would have the flexibility to push forward as law as far as the funding that they had already see, received and committed would allow them. Okay, and uh, maybe a, uh, I guess it's not really quite the same question. If the individual mandate is overturned, will Congress modify the bill to include a tax provision? Or I guess, what do you think the probabilities are? I guess, again, we're asking for your prediction, uh, your crystal ball. So when you say tax provision, would, would the Congress step in and say, okay, there's no longer a mandate, so we're going to put some, some type of provision in the tax law that, it, it, that it somehow um, acts like a mandate or, or an incentive of some sort? I, I guess that's the question, yes. You know, so in that scenario, I think the... Um, the, the question I would, would ask back is, what Congress, right? So is this a Republican Congress? Is this a split Congress? Or is this, in, in, in a scenario we didn't talk about, is this a, a scenario where Democrats retain the Senate and actually pick up the House? Not a likely scenario, but nonetheless a possible scenario. So I, I think that, that is a, that's a, that's a, that's a big question that I wouldn't speculate a guess on um, without kind of some, some narrowing of, of who's in, what the Congress looks like and, and who's in the, in the presidency, who holds the presidency to be able to determine the likelihood that that would, in fact, uh, have uh, some, some legs. Okay, and maybe one last question. If the Medicaid expansion is overturned, what happens to the people under, eligible under that expansion? Aren't they unable to participate in the exchange? Um, and so if the law is overturned, so then that, that, that expansion would no longer exist. So uh, people who are eligible for Medicaid would just fall under each state's traditional Medicaid eligibility rules. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what happens with states, I don't think, you know, people who are in Medicaid under the traditional eligibility rules probably would not go to the exchange. But those, you know, between, you know, say that this state standard is 20% FCL for a for uh, parents with dependent children on Medicaid, anybody above that 20%, I think would be free to go into the exchange if the state decides to set that up. One of the uh, companion questions there for that is, if the law is overturned, 
does the state build an exchange? Exactly. Right. So yeah. there will be some states that either already have an exchange or continue to build that. We believe that number isn't very high, right? Because what will, what will occur is that the, the subsidies in that instance, if the law is overturned, that the entire subsidies go away. So that incentive for a state to build an exchange goes away. Um, the requirements go away. The guaranteed issue goes away. I mean, sorry, the mandate goes away. So much of what drives the state today to do that. Also, the funding for them to go, to build that exchange, unless they've already um, actually contracted with a with a with an organization to build that exchange, that also is a question. So, um, you know, much lower number in terms of states that actually build an exchange. The, the, the states that are interested in exchange are likely to do one of two things: either pursue a private uh, model or pursue an exchange that's more in the small group and start from that and, and then build out. So the um, question is, would they be you know, eligible for an exchange? First question is, is there an exchange in the state? What type? And then as Laura has suggested, the eligibility goes back to what it was for Medicaid before. And so those people that were in the expansion population would be as they were before. OK. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, it, I, I sort of thought as I was putting this together, I expected a, a rousing set of questions and conversation, and I think we received it. We can't give you a round of applause on a webinar, but we would if we could. Um, thank you very much for loaning your expertise to us. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you who listened into the webinar and continue to watch our website and Knowledge Center for both the posting of this webinar and notice of future ones. And as always, we ask if any of you in attendance have a suggestion for a topic or a speaker to please let us know. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you.